As we've seen in the last lesson, phase transitions occur when we have our Gibbs energy, uh, the change in Gibbs energy equal to zero. And so this gives us a good thermodynamic criteria for identifying when a phase equilibrium has occurred, when that uh, Gibbs energy is related to a phase transition like vaporization or uh, fusion like melting. Now, in order to get a handle on this, we need to have a good idea of how these things are affected by pressure and by temperature. So I'll remind you that we had earlier found that our Gibbs energy could be, uh, its behavior with respect to temperature uh, could be determined from looking at its partial derivative with respect to temperature at constant pressure, which we know is equal to minus s. And let's go ahead and make these be molar quantities. And it's partial derivative with respect to pressure at constant temperature, which is given by, and again, molar quantities, the volume. All right, so Gibbs energy as a natural variable of temperature and pressure is exactly the right variable, I guess, uh, when we're concerned about changes in the temperature and pressure on these quantities. Now, I also want to remind you of a picture that we showed a little while ago that showed how the Gibbs energy and the enthalpy change as a function of temperature. And um, in effect, what happens is that when we're at zero Kelvin, and this is temperature on the horizontal axis, um, both the Gibbs energy and the, and the enthalpy are going to be uh, basically the same value. Now, we haven't really talked about absolute values for Gibbs energy or enthalpy because uh, we can't. Uh, there is no standard uh, that uh, we can use to establish an exact number for how much Gibbs energy there is or how much enthalpy there is. In fact, the best we can do in an experiment is to measure the change in those quantities. However, let's assume that there is uh, su such a, a, an absolute value. For both of these, it would be at the same point. And we know that the enthalpy gradually increases as a function of temperature, so we can draw it something like this. And I'm going to draw it curving slightly up uh, simply because we know that H as a function of uh, heat capacity at temperature is just going to be the heat capacity as a function of temperature dt. And the heat capacity itself is changing a little bit with temperature, so there's a little bit of curvature there. Uh, similarly, for the Gibbs free energy, we can see that its change with temperature is, uh, at least for the molar Gibbs energy, is negative the molar entropy. And so that means it's going, and since entropy is always a positive quantity, that means that the Gibbs energy is actually going to slope downward. But I'm going to say that it slopes downward a little bit more steeply than the enthalpy slopes upward. And let's go ahead and make these molar quantities in this graph. Now the reason that Gibbs energy slopes down a little bit more steeply is that in addition to having negative s as its slope, we also know that um, the enthalpy, uh, sorry, the entropy itself is uh, changing as a function of pressure, and in fact it has this value as a function of pressure, uh, as a partial derivative with respect to temperature of pressure. And so this is an increasing quantity also. So the slope of G is increasing in magnitude and it is negative, so it's going to slope down sharper. And as we indicated before, this difference between these two curves is just the temperature times the entropy. All right, so um, we can use this, if we will, to uh, to chart both all three of these ent uh, all three of these entities: enthalpy, Gibbs energy, and entropy. Now, what I want to build out of this is to build on this picture of the of the uh, molar Gibbs energy curve, uh, so that we can get a picture of what it looks like for the different phases. So I'm going to note here that. The Gibbs energy, even the molar Gibbs energy for the vapor, the Gibbs energy for the liquid, and the Gibbs energy for the solid are all going to be different quantities. In other words, they're going to be distinct from one another. So as we did uh, earlier, we're going to treat them as distinct. And of course, they also have their own, since they're molar Gibbs quantities, they also have their own chemical potentials associated with each. Now, I will use these two uh, sets of notation, the uh, g bar and mu, interchangeably, but they are the same thing as far as we're concerned. Now, what is this going to look like? What do I want to draw? Okay, what I want to show you is a picture 
of what these various components of the Gibbs energy look like as a function of temperature. So I'm going to make a big graph here because I want to show a lot of information. All right, now the first thing I'm going to graph is I'm going to graph the uh, Gibbs energy of the solid. So here, let's say it starts down here. So this is the molar Gibbs energy of the solid. Now we know it's going to slope downward. Its slope is going to be moderated by the fact that it is equal to minus s. And we know that, for example, the molar entropy of the solid is less than the molar entropy of a liquid. And that's less, actually much less, than the molar entropy of a gas. I'll make that a vapor. All right, so this gives us an idea of, relatively speaking, how fast each of these phases is going to uh, slope downward. So in the case of the slot, I'm, I'm going to make this a very gentle slope because I need to account for larger slopes when I talk about both the uh, liquid and the gas. Now, the liquid, and I'll draw this one in blue, is going to start a little bit higher than the solid. Now, why is that? Well, remember over here on this far axis, if we're talking about 0k, these are both equivalent to enthalpies. And we know that there is an enthalpy change in going from a solid to a liquid. And that's also going to be true at 0k, although it's uh, never been measured. But we can think of this difference here, and I didn't leave enough room to write it, but we can think of this difference here as being delta fusion of enthalpy that separates these two marks. All right, but we also know that because the entropy of the liquid is greater than the entropy of the solid, that it's going to slope down faster. So if I, even though I'm starting above, since this is going to slope down faster, I know at some point it's got to cross this solid line. It's got to cross as it goes down um, somewhere like here. All right, now what about the vapor? I'm going to draw that one in red. To distinguish it. So the vapor is going to start higher still. So this is the molar entropy of the vapor, uh, sorry, the molar Gibbs energy of the vapor. Once again, I have a gap here. This gap is going to be related to the delta vaporization of the enthalpy. Okay, so there is a difference there. This one is going to be the steepest yet. In fact, it's much steeper than either of these. So as I draw it, I would need to draw a curve that's going to come down and it's going to eventually catch up to the liquid and to the solid and come on down like this. Now I've, I've exaggerated this because I needed to uh, show you that these things all intersect at some point. So this one has an intersection point here as well. All right, so what's actually happening here and how can we interpret this diagram? How can we get useful information? Well, the first thing I want to say, and this may sound like it's not useful information, but that is that this part of this curve and this part of this curve largely do not exist. We can't have a liquid and a vapor that are really below uh, the point at which they are likely to form. These are very low temperatures down in this region. So at very low temperatures, we know that this um, substance is going to be a solid. And in fact, we know it from this diagram also because, in effect, the phase that has the lowest Gibbs energy at any uh, segment of this diagram is going to be the one that is the most stable phase. So most stable phase corresponds to the phase with the lowest molar Gibbs energy. All right, so let me draw that in black so that we can distinguish this. So for this solid curve, I'm going to have this part here is, in fact, the solid phase. And then when I get to this point, the one with the lowest uh, Gibbs energy is this part of this liquid curve. And when I get to this point, then the one with the lowest Gibbs energy is the vapor. So this is why we end up uh, changing, if you will, over, uh, over the temperature. We end up changing from solid, which is this purple line, to liquid, which is the blue line, to vapor, which is the red line. All right, And the points at which these transitions are made are exactly where the phase transitions occur. So we can read directly off of this, for example, 
if we go straight down here to this temperature, this is the temperature at which fusion occurs. Now I should, actually I uh, neglected to mention that this diagram is being drawn for some constant pressure. So this temperature of fusion may not be the normal melting point. Um, it's the melting point that occurs for this particular pressure that this diagram is being drawn for. So the pressure is the same throughout this diagram. We're only showing how the variation goes with temperature. All right, likewise, if I draw a line straight down from this intersection point, this is where the temperature of vaporization occurs at this pressure. All right, so we get a, a very nice picture here of by simply following where the Gibbs energy goes, this, this solid black line along here that goes from here to this point over uh, this point here to this point here, we follow that Gibbs energy as it changes, um, we're actually seeing the evolution of the different phases occur as it passes through a fusion temperature and a vaporization temperature. Now I do want to say one thing about this part that doesn't exist. There's a, a bit of this curve up here which sometimes can be achieved in, in a laboratory and we would think of this as a supercooled fluid. So it is a liquid that is cooled below the, technically below the melting point or below the freezing point, but it's a very unstable phase and it's not going, it's not going to stay as a liquid for very long. Any minor perturbation is going to send it into the solid phase. But we do see that occasionally sometimes. We can also see superheated fluids and super, um, and superheated solids, but those are also extremely rare. So mostly we're going to be on this thick black line that goes through these two points. Now one of the things that we can note from this is that the Gibbs molar energy is continuous throughout. In other words, we never have a break where we can't actually assign a value to the Gibbs molar energy. So it's a continuous function of temperature but its derivative, so this, is not continuous. That is to say, it breaks at these points where the phase transitions occur. So at these two points that have been circled, this slope is going to change in a discontinuous way. And so that change in discontinuity reflects the change in phase that happens uh, for these molecules. Uh, at this point, I think that's probably all I need to say about this particular curve, but we're going to be visiting this curve a lot in explaining different features that we, exam that we see, uh, particularly in vaporization processes. But this curve, I think, is a very nice, tidy explanation that helps us understand the relationship between Gibbs energy and phase transitions. And these points that I've circled represent points at which we have phase equilibrium.